It's easy to talk the talk. It's more difficult to walk the walk. But one car company is. That's this week on Motoring 2005. SN's Motoring 2005 is brought to you by the new Q from Quaker State. Unleash all your horses. And Midas, for mechanics known for their work and their word. Trust the Midas touch. This week we find ourselves in the middle of a rainforest. This one is located on the big island of Hawaii. Over 2,000 species of plant and wildlife exist here, and it's also a natural playground for the locals. As we all know, the biggest enemy to this forest is pollution. And us humans are doing our part to reduce pollution, but in the car world, nobody is trying harder than Toyota. Here are some of the facts. Last year, Toyota's profit was up 29%, the $3.8 billion. That's more than the combined profit of both Ford and General Motors. Toyota sold 1.8 million vehicles in the U.S., but here's the catch. The gasoline electric hybrid Prius vehicle accounted for only just over 24,000 sales. In fact, they only sold about 53,000 worldwide. So is Toyota getting discouraged? Hardly. In fact, they are predicting they will sell 300,000 hybrid vehicles by the end of 2005. The question is, how are they going to do it? Well, this week we're going to try and find some answers. We said it right at the start of hybrid, and that was that uh, you know there was going to be some sort of new paradigm for the automobile, and the company that got there first was going to uh, to really set the market for uh, you know for the coming decades. We think we've done that with, uh, with hybrid, and that really is the story of the future for Toyota. It's, it's to have that hybrid alternative available across, uh, across our lineup. And now with uh, the RX400H and on into Highlander Hybrid and some other vehicles to come, it's really about the future platform that's going to build the company. And it's, I think uh, for us, we see it as a vehicle that's a real conquest vehicle as well. It, it, it brings people to the Toyota brand who are looking for that combination of, uh, of environmental responsibility along with high performance and the things that you know, make them happy about driving a vehicle. I think they're into this because they believe it and um, they're coming out with technologies that actually prove that it's working. Early buyers were environmentally conscious and wanted to do the right thing for the planet. Later buyers are more mainstream buyers that just want a very practical vehicle that doesn't harm the planet so their kids can, can live better in the future. The progress now has been to open the segment even further by introduction of the Lexus RX 400H, a vehicle that trades off some of the fuel efficiency for significantly improved performance. This vehicle will be uh, best-in-class acceleration, V8 level performance acceleration out of a six-cylinder vehicle, getting compact sedan fuel economy levels. We're going to sell the vehicle on the basis of its performance, which is spectacular, and then delight them by virtue of the fact that they go to the gas station significantly less often and run up less of a gasoline bill in the process. So they're going to do something good for the environment, also has very low exhaust emissions, and not make any compromise. The vehicle still tows, you know, 1,600 kilos, yeah, as does the, the base RX 330 vehicle, uh, has better acceleration performance than the RX 330 vehicle, and gets you know, significantly better fuel efficiency at, at 8.4 liters per 100 kilometers. I think they've got a really good product here, and the fact that it's finally entering into that segment that seems so popular right now, the SUVs, um, which are primarily mostly responsible for all the greenhouse gas emissions that cars produce, I think is going to have a big impact on how much gas is used and, and how much pollution goes into the air over time. Right now, they are so far ahead of everybody else in the game, except Honda, perhaps, 
that uh, they are building cars that are eminently drivable. You know, the one that we're just doing right now, this new Lexus RX400H, is uh, just a better vehicle than the gas-powered 330. There will be a buzz that the, that the vehicle is different. It is a hybrid, and hybrid is gaining some cachet. It's early yet to tell what it is. It certainly doesn't have the cachet of Emmy yet, but maybe it will someday. There are a lot of Lexus touches about this vehicle. Um, you know, we'll, we'll leave it to the drivers to uh, to decide whether we've we've hit the target. But uh, but our objective was to be nothing less than the best. And I think the more people get exposed to Toyota's hybrid technology, the more people are going to say, "This is going to be my next car." Now, there may be a little bit of rust on that old Toyota, but guess what? Those cars do last. More later on Kenzie's Corner. Whenever you redesign a car that's an industry accepted benchmark, you take a risk. When the car in question happens to account for about 44% of your total sales volume, well that risk becomes enormous. This week on Test Drive, the all new 3 Series BMW. The new 3 Series may have big shoes to fill, but fill them it does and in fine fashion. Rather than being a mild rework, just about everything is new and better than whatever it replaces. This is particularly true of the look. While noticeably larger in its physical dimensions, it does not feel at all ponderous. And this holds true whether cruising a boulevard or beating up the skid pad. You know, when it comes to eating the pylon test alive, this new 3 Series is about as good as it gets. To begin with, the new body is 25% stiffer than the outgoing car. That gives you a great base of operations. Add to that a suspension setup that dials out all body roll and the steering that's razor sharp without being at all twitchy, 50-50 front to rear weight distribution and 40 series 18 inch wheels and tires. The bottom line, you have a package that doesn't get any better. It really is a remarkable ride. The rear tires also contribute to the handling. Being an even lower 35 series rubber band means there's absolutely no sidewall flex when the tire is pushed. Surprisingly, given the low profile tires and that taut suspension, it does not equate to a firm ride. Indeed, it's as cushy as many so-called luxury cars while handling like the Dickens. There is not another manufacturer that gets suspension design as well as BMW. Now, if you add to that a good electronic stability control system, and well, as I said before, things don't get any better. One of the biggest complaints with the old 3 Series was the fact that the rear seat was little more than a token item where you put your briefcase. In this new car, much, much better. 35mm stretch to the wheelbase means there's now some semblance of legroom. The extra width, well, it now means it's comfortable. It does, however, mean that this is still a four-seater car. This tunnel intrusion and thin padding, well, if you're unlucky enough to sit there, all I can say is good luck. The scary part about the way the 3 handles is that this is with the base steering. Adding the active steering option transforms it into the best the industry has to offer. On the one hand, it speeds up the steering's reaction to input at low speeds, which brings a much faster response and fewer turns lock to lock. On the other hand, it slows down the reaction at higher speeds, which vastly improves straight line stability. The brakes follow this lead. Not only is the pedal easily modulated, they scrub off speed very effectively and without showing any signs of fade. When you slip behind the wheel of this new 3 Series, you'll instantly recognize it as a BMW. Quality materials and all the rest of it. However, there are a couple of subtle changes. To begin with, you start the engine through a stop-start button on the dash. There is also a package that is an absolute must and that's the Sport Pack. It will set you back 2800 bucks, but you know what? It brings those marvelous 18-inch 40 series tires that work so well on the skid pad 
and these fabulous sport seats. Good bolstering in the base and these massive bolsters in the backrest, well they're adjustable and really do a good job of keeping you planted when you play. The 330's new engine takes a leaf out of the 7 Series book by adding Valtronic. Without getting overly technical, this design does away with the traditional throttle which frees the passage of air to the engine. Instead, it uses the intake valves to control idle speed and output, and that the 330 now has, 255 horsepower and 220 pound-feet of torque. The use of variable valve timing then spreads this goodness over a very broad range. Likewise, the six-speed manual has a set of ratios that marry the engine's work ethic perfectly. So even when you do find yourself in the wrong gear, well, the baby bimmer just keeps pulling. For the record, the 330 takes just 6.3 seconds to reach a metric ton. This latest BMW really does solve an age-old dilemma. You need a four-door sedan to accommodate family obligations, but you want to drive a truly sporty car. Well, this new 3 Series satisfies both the need and the want, and it does so in a package that sets a new benchmark. Our Midas tip of the week concerns fuel octane. In most cases, you'll have at least three and sometimes four choices when you get to the pumps and you've got to pick the right fuel octane for your car. Starting point, like many other things, your owner's manual. See what your car actually calls for. And the majority of cars are quite happy to run on low octane fuel, which is 87 octane fuel. That's the one that you see with the advertised price at the pumps. Your next step up is 89 octane. The next step is usually 91 octane, high octane gas. And in some cases, you may have a choice above 91, 93 or 94 octane. And of course, you're paying more at each incre incremental level. Now, in some cases, the car that calls for low octane fuel, when your driving requirements change, you may have to bump up the fuel octane. You listen for knock or ping in that engine. If the engine's protesting when it's under load, when you're accelerating hard, hill climbing or towing a trailer, if you hear some knocking out of that engine, try bumping the fuel octane up to at least the next level or a couple of levels till you get rid of that noise. If you've got a car that's turbocharged, supercharged, or a high performance engine, that owner's manual may demand that you use 91 octane. If that's the case, make sure you've got the right octane in your fuel tank. That's your Midas tip of the week. We're at uh, Paramount Canada's Wonderland. The big deal for them this year is the opening of the all new uh, roller coaster ride, the Italian Job Stunt Track. It's an exceptional ride that picks up some of the theme from the uh, recently released movie, The Italian Job, and they use minis to take you around and show you how uh, a roller coaster and how a mini can handle. We have invited 30 journalists from around the world, from Italy, Germany, uh, and Great Britain, to try various minis, whether they be convertibles or the hatchbacks. And it culminates today with uh, a coned course drive event. And then uh, we're going to shortly go over and let them try the ride. Mini was a terrific partner because obviously what this ride came down to was the details and incorporating the Cooper S into the actual experience was pivotal to, to get bringing that experience to life for our guests and we actually have incorporated 75% scale Mini Cooper S is on the actual attraction which is phenomenal. It actually takes you from 0 to 65 kilometers in 3 seconds. We use a launch mechanism which is very, very, very fast. And we incorporate some terrific special effects including fire, water, smoke. It's absolutely phenomenal. 
after about the seventh uh, ride and three consecutive ones, uh, you feel a little dizzy coming off. Like the first time is a little bit of a surprise because you don't know what you're expecting. And the second time you see more and more because you keep your eyes open and actually get your hands up a little bit more. Probably one of the best ones here. Uh, it's, it's the biggest surprise, that's for sure. I believe this year they anticipate over 1.6 million people will ride this ride this year. And it might just make them think a little bit that, geez, this Mini is pretty cool. Behind me is the new Lexus RX 400 Hybrid, which you saw earlier in the program. Now, because an embargo is in place, we can't give you any details on the vehicle. We'll save that for a future test drive with Graham. But what I can tell you is that on that engine, there are zero belts. Key things like air conditioning and power steering are run by electrical motors. And the reason is quite simple. When that hybrid vehicle is at a standstill, the engine shuts down and so would your air conditioning, which might be a little dicey here in Hawaii. But no belts. I wonder if that's a good thing or a bad thing for our man in the Quaker State garage, Bill Gardner. How about it, Bill? Well, I guess that's one last thing to go wrong, eh, Brad? But uh, in terms of the air conditioning dropping out, all of us here at Motoring 2005 are in such top physical condition, we couldn't break a sweat if we tried, so who needs air conditioning? And besides, north of the 49th parallel, eight months of winter, four months of poor sledding, who wants air conditioning? When we finally get a nice day like today, we want to have the top down like we do on our Corvette tester here and enjoy this good weather while it lasts. Now, my friend Stuart's visiting from England. Every time he's been here over the last three or four years, he is one thing that he always consistently asked me about is Corvettes. Corvette, Corvette, Corvette. So I tried to get him a Corvette while he was here for a 10-day trip. Didn't look like it was going to work out. And the last day of his trip, we've got the Corvette and we went for a real blast. Couldn't believe the power, the handling, and how easy this car is to drive. It's just an absolute breeze and a pleasure to drive this car. The power, the handling, unbelievable. Today has been an experience. What a great car, lived up to every expectation I have. The only problem I would have with it if I had it back in England is the mileage as far as the petrol consumption. It does a great 37 on the highway, but with our petrol prices twice, at least twice as expensive for yours, it'd be an expensive drive. Needless to say, we got some great shots for Stuart to take home to England and show to his buddies in the Corvette, around the Corvette, driving the Corvette going to be great for him that's for sure when he goes home and he brags to his buddies with driving those little most motored cars over there he can tell him he drove some true american iron here with a six liter 400 horsepower v8 nothing like it man i'll tell you one thing that really struck me about the corvette was just how easy it was to do a lot of the service operations on this car for example if you had a misfire with the engine and this is not uncommon when you get high mileage on a, on a spark ignited engine you've got a dead miss maybe a bad plug wire a bad ignition coil a bad spark plug very easy to isolate, very easy to get at the coils, the plug wires, even the spark plugs on this big engine in a small car, very easy to get at. It's really, really amazing. One thing that really struck me as well, uh, the Corvette uses cylinder deactivation if the engine should ever overheat. Let's say, for example, you damaged your fan belt or a rad hose and you had the engine overheating. Lights will come on on the dash, the check engine light and the engine overheat lights will come on in the dash, then it deactivates cylinders. So you have reduced power but you can drive the car even with the engine overheating without damaging the engine. And what it does is it, it air cools, it alternates shutting off cylinders a bank at a time and it air cools those cylinders that aren't firing so that the engine will not overheat and you can limp the car home. Now the GM pickup trucks also have that capability of limping home with an overheating engine and the cylinder deactivation is used on other cars to gain fuel mileage. For example, the Honda Odyssey vaulted into first place in the van fuel mileage category last year by using cylinder deactivation and the Chrysler 300 with the Hemi uses it to get great highway fuel economy even with the big engine. Now the Corvette has decent fuel economy because it's got so much muscle it can pull a, a tall gear ratio and the highway fuel economy, believe it or not, on this car, 37 miles per gallon. It's a fantastic car. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 2005. most powerful man in the automobile industry? Well, that's probably 
J.D. Power, David Power, he figured out years ago a system for measuring initial quality in new cars, and he publishes his statistics every year, and the car makers really pay attention. This year, well, no big surprise, the number one uh, brand for quality was once again Toyota. Maybe one of the surprises, though, was that number two was Jaguar. Now, Jaguar in the good old days wasn't exactly known for their quality, style, ride, handling, sure, but assembly quality, not one of their strong points. But ever since Ford took them over, they've been improving year by year, and this year they actually took out full-page newspaper ads bragging about the fact that they're number two. It's sort of like that old Avis Rent-A-Car deal. We're number two, we gotta try harder. But it is, in fact, a great story for Jaguar. The other great story, that isn't really a news story because it's been going on for years, is that of all the car plants in North and South America, the number one plant, right here in Canada, General Motors plant in Oshawa, Ontario. The second best plant, North America and South America, the other General Motors plant in Oshawa. These guys have always been very near the top of the game and they maintain that lead on a regular basis. But you know, it's not just them. One of Honda's best plants is in Alliston, Ontario. One of Toyota's best plants is in Cambridge, Ontario. Chrysler's best plant is in Bramalee. Ford's best plant, well, one of them anyway, is in St. Thomas, Ontario, building that venerable old Crown Victoria. And if you think it's easy to build an old piece of stuff like that, well, you've got another thing coming. The fact is, not only are Canadians among the best car makers in the world, they're amongst the cheapest because we have a relatively weak Canadian dollar, we've got nationalized Medicare, we've got nationalized pensions. One of these days, the Americans might figure that out, but until they do, you Canadian car workers, keep doing what you're doing because you're the best there is. I'm Jim Kenny. The ecosystem in Hawaii, to say the least, is fragile. 90% of the plant and animal life is endemic. It is found nowhere else in the world. Yet most of the electrical power here is generated by diesel fuel burning power plants, which equals a lot of pollution. And if they don't watch it, the rest of the island is going to end up looking like this. But the same could be said about the rest of this planet. So hats off to the people at Toyota who have made a major, major commitment to low emission vehicles. The rest now is up to us. That's it for now. We'll see you next time out as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. I think there's a perception out there by a lot of people that SUVs are not safe, but the reality is that they are very safe vehicles. TSN's Motoring 2005 has been brought to you by the new Q from Quaker State. Unleash all your horses. And Midas, for mechanics known for their work and their word. Trust the Midas touch.